you've tuned in to the 49ers Rush Podcast, and here is your host, John Chapman. All right, welcome to another 49ers Rush Podcast, and I'm pumped about today. We have been going through all the different position groups and talking about who's in, who's out, and all that stuff, and this is probably my favorite position group of the entire roster. And that is the defensive tackle slash D-end hybrids. The guys that play that three through five technique and all that they bring. So, again, by far the strongest position group we have. And I really believe as we talk through this, the 49ers season will go as far as this group takes us. And probably should have led with this, but uh, the 49ers Rush Podcast, guess what? We are moving up in the world. We have a stat guy now that is doing a whole bunch of the legwork for these episodes, and I want you to go give him a follow. He is a mad Canadian that is just absolutely awesome. You can follow him on Twitter, at Cadeau Clayton, and again, it's Canadian, so it's that awesome French spelling, so it's at C-A-D-I-E-U-X Clayton. So at Cadeau Clayton, go give him a follow. He is a writer over at Eat Sleep Fantasy with me as well and just does tremendous work. One of the, like the most in-depth follows that you're going to fo- find out there. So go give him a follow on Twitter and let's get started. So last year the 49ers kept four of these kind of end three through five techniques and we're not going to be covering the nose tackle interior guys that play that kind of head up to the center to the three technique. But w- this is the ends. So They kept four last year, and I have them keeping four again, but this could change. This is one of the positions that I I could totally see them keeping five players. So the four players we're going to talk about today are kind of the big guys. Three of them are first-round draft picks, and then there's Ronald Blair. So we got DeForest Buckner, Solomon Thomas, Eric Armstrad, and then Ronald Blair. So those are the guys we're going to be talking about today. And again, the nose tackle guys. Uh, Earl Mitchell, Don Jones, even Sheldon Day, who might be considered in this group. We're going to be discussing them on the next episode. Now, I have all four of these guys as locks, and we are going to go through and explain the strengths, weaknesses, and what it is that they need to bring to the table for this 2018 49ers team. And right off the bat, you know, I have I've talked about this guy at length on here, and that's DeForest Buckner. I huge fan of his college game way back whenever he was the Pac-12 defensive player of the year out of Oregon. We drafted him seventh overall in the 2016 draft out of Oregon. As I said, six foot seven, 300 pounds. This kid just does not make sense. He is absolutely unreal. And the thing that he brings above all else, his strength is pass rush. He, He finished third at his position in 2017 with an 89.6 grade in the pass rush from the interior D-line spot. He is an absolute freak. Now, his sack numbers won't bear that out, but whenever you look at how many hits he had on the quarterback, which we're going to talk about, that is what makes him so special. Now, the weaknesses, and again, this is nitpicking and trying to figure out a way, is one, maybe his sack totals, but he is so far superior when it comes to strength and agility over the offensive lineman that he plays upright a lot because he will look and then be able to throw them to the side and chase after the play. I really wish, and again, this is nitpicking, uh, I wish he would play behind his pads instead of under his pads at certain times. But again, that's just nitpicking. He has nine sacks in his two years in the league. And again, whenever you're looking at that from an interior spot, That is elite, but he hasn't even scratched the surface for how good this guy can be. I couldn't believe that he wasn't voted to the top 100 players, the NFL network thing that they did, but this will be the last year he is not on there. He's had 88 tackles, 46 assisted tackles, and he's only missed one game in his two NFL seasons. But having said that, when Buckner is on the field, the 49ers ranked 11th in pressure rate at 36.5% of those snaps. So if it's a pass play and Buckner's on the field, we are getting pressure 36, so about a third of the time. Without him, man, we are dead last in the NFL. So if you look at a pass play when DeForest Buckner was not on the field for the 49ers, we were only getting 28.1% pressure on those plays on the quarterback, which is dead last in the NFL. And he led the entire NFL with most hits against the quarterback with 19. And that's the thing. 
he's getting so close, but we have such a lack of edge pressure that he will get great push up the middle, and the quarterback can just escape out very, very easily because there's no edge pressure. So it, one of the great things about football is it is the ultimate team sport. Uh, it's one of the few that if you have the best player out there, that doesn't guarantee you a win. You have to play as a team, and I'm just really excited and hope that the people around DeForest Buckner can step their game up to his level. Now, his physical skills, they're nothing that's really special besides his size. Uh, finished top 15% for 40-yard dash and speed score among his position. Now, his contract isn't great, but it's not bad. We did give him the seventh overall pick, and so his cap hit this year is right at about $5 million. Next year to be $5.7 million. and then we get into his 2020 fifth year option which will be picked up guaranteed and because he was picked in the top 10 that means he will be averaged with the top 10 defensive ends in the nfl and that is what's going to determine his pay which is going to be a lot it's going to be a big deal especially after and donald's deal gets done after and Sue gets another deal because he's on a one-year prove it deal right now so that's going to be a big one but you can guarantee um deforest buckner will be picked up his fifth year option he again he's one of those candidates that could be a defensive player of the year not just for the 49ers I think he already is that for the 49ers, but I think for the entire NFL. Uh, I, I cannot express how high I am on this kid who could be an all-pro player at a very stacked position in the NFL whenever you think about uh, Sue, you think about Aaron Donald, you think about Fletcher Cox, you think about Jarrell Casey, you think about all these different players. He is in that category and perhaps could be better than all of them. Aaron Donald's probably the one that's lone above right now, but He's not far behind. Uh, He is an absolute beast whenever it comes to playing uh, snaps, 863 defensive snaps, and he led all defensive tackles through the last two years and most snaps taken. And that's DeForest Buckner. Now, the crazy thing is, last year he only had three sacks, and he is the, him and Solomon Thomas both had three sacks last year. Those are the leading sack getters on our team last year that are carried over onto our roster for 2018. Doomerville led the team with six and a half but again we are devoid our defense of people that get sacks and we need to him to get closer to that five to six sack range which might not sound like a lot but again you have to understand he is doing this up the middle interior pressure he's not doing this going off the side with speed he is fighting against double teams on a lot of plays so that's DeForest Buckner now let's jump to our rookie from last year Solomon Thomas Six foot two, 280. And this measurement, it's very interesting as we go through these positions. You see things that, whether that's John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan, or Robert Saleh in this defense, he loves certain measurements. And this 280 number, he likes these hybrid players that fit 280. And we got a lot of them. And if you, you go through our roster, and you look at what we got, we've got about four guys that are in that 280 range. Now, we drafted him third overall last year. I wasn't pleased with the pick. I thought it was a safe pick. But the fact that we traded back from the second overall to the third overall with the Bears, and we picked up a whole bunch of draft capital that we used to trade back up and get Ruben Foster, I think it was a great play. Very, very happy with how that worked out. Now, Solomon Thomas is only 22 years old. People don't understand. This kid's super, super young. And we got him out of Stanford last year. Now, the strengths of this guy, I almost want to put an asterisk by it because he has strengths in his game as an interior player. And whenever you put him on the outside like the 49ers do, a lot of those strengths dissipate and you do not see them on film. However... He is a guy that gets in the backfield. He plays the majority of his snaps in the backfield. He is not a guy that gets stalemated. He has insane push, great technique, and is beyond explosive. Whenever he's on the outside, however, he loses some of that. He's very undersized to be a defensive end, and he gets out of control a lot. He is one of those guys that just goes so fast and so hard on every play He might be one of the league leaders in getting his hands on the quarterback or hands on the ball carrier, but he doesn't always bring them down. And this was a major critique coming out of college as well in Sanford. He would get back there, 
and it looked like he's going to have a sack easy, but the quarterback would step up or spin out, and he just he flies off, which is a bummer. Again, he's a tweener. What I mean by that is he's in between, so he's in between two different positions, uh, defensive end and defensive tackle in the system, and we, we play him out of position. It seems like we're going to do that again next year. Now, he only played 14 games last year, and his stats were pretty poor because, again, he didn't look good on the edge. His effort is great, and he has some major splash plays where you watch him, and if you just watch those highlights, you are like, oh, my God, this kid is for real. But uh, I've said on here, and I'll continue to say, highlights are like somebody's dating profile they make of themselves, and watching the game film play in and play out, that is like talking to somebody's ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend. You're going to get all the dirt and all the good, so don't rely on highlights. I get it. The kid flash. And he flashes a lot. We just need him to be more consistent. He ended up playing 71% of his snaps on the outside. And that is, that's atrocious. And I feel really bad because we are doing this kid a disservice. But he's not the type of kid that's going to complain. So uh, obviously 71% outside, that means less than 30% on the inside. Now he pressured the quarterback. Now we're getting into some crazy percentages. But I think that this will prove the point of where this kid is efficient and where he is built to play versus where we are playing him. Now, and again, if we don't play him outside, well, who are we going to play? We don't really have a lot. And so this is kind of why he's being forced to play outside. He pressured the quarterback on 21% of his pass, reps in, pass rushes inside and only 16% whenever he was on the edge. And it's much harder to get pressure inside. That's the thing. Like, you are supposed to be able to get pressure outside because you are only going against one guy. But we move him inside, he actually becomes even more productive, which is counterintuitive to defensive play logic. And so he dropped from a 92.7 overall grade in college. He was the number one graded player by Pro Football Focus coming out of college for disruptions, stopping the run and all that. And he had a 53 Point two grade at the pro level last year in his rookie year and again a lot of that has to do with playing out of position he rushed the passer on 401 snaps and something that he's just got he's just gonna have to be more consistent one of the things that really bothered me is he is great in the run game and he plays with a lot of energy super high motor guy but he's not calm and collected on the outside whenever there's a toss play or a zone stretch play he got uh he got reached several times and gave up outside contain several times. And one of our least efficient defensive kind of setups was when him and Jaquiski Tart were on the same side and Jaquiski Tart would walk up into the box. You had two guys that are very, very similar in how they play, lights out, great effort, but not very containment oriented. And a lot of big plays that we gave up were because those two guys were to the same side. So something that you just might want to look at next year as you are watching the games, if you see those two guys next to each other, just take a deep breath and say, oh man, this is not going to go well. But uh, he's an a athletic freak for what he is at 6'2", 280. Uh, had the best three-cone time uh, for all defensive linemen, ran a 4.69 in the 40, and a 35-inch vertical at 280 pounds is just, it's nuts. Now, because he was a top three pick, he's very, very expensive. He is $6.3 million this year, $7.7 7 next year, and then up to $9 million 2020. And then, of course, we have the fifth-year option in 2021 if the collective bargaining thing can all get worked out. Now, and again, this just shows you the difference between Buckner and Solomon Thomas. He took 696 defensive snaps last year. So you're talking about somebody that's basically 200, almost 200 snaps less than DeForest Buckner that plays very similar positions. And he did get a couple of snaps on special teams, 58 there. He did get injured. He had a minor low-grade MCL strain last year. It cost him two games, but uh, he fought through it and came back. And, man, if this kid can take a jump this year and get in that five to six sack range, now if he's going to be playing outside and if we play him at 71% outside and he only hits five to six sacks, that's going to be a huge loss. If we continue playing a majority outside, he's got to get to that eight. Eight is the magic sack number that we need him to get to. But if they move him inside, that's not as important because it's much more of a pressure-oriented game inside. 
Now let's move on to our third player, and again, another lock. Now, he possibly could be traded, but I, I thought during the draft there was a possibility of that, and that's Eric Armstead, another guy out of Oregon. That is huge. He was drafted 17th overall, and so we have three years in a row where we drafted defensive ends in the top 17 of the draft, and it's still a position of need for us. Now, Buckner has lived beyond expectations. Eric Armstead has not. Uh, six foot seven, 292 pounds, and he's still only 24. He's very, very, very young. And the thing with him is he is very quick for his size, explosive and versatile. He could play all four defensive lineman spots. But, again, very inconsistent and very... I guess undurable. I don't even think that's a word. He's not durable. He gets injured way too much. He's only played 30 games in his NFL career, and that's not okay. His first year, he played them all, and he's only got 16 combined games the last two years. So back-to-back years, he has missed about half the season. Now, I will say this. He has 77 total QB pressures in those 30 games that he has played. And he's the only defensive lineman that we have left over from 2015. So you have a complete turnover in just two short years since our new coaching staff has showed up. Uh, PFF ranked him as the most productive pass rushing 3-4 D end the last two years. And now we're changing out of that system. And we haven't really seen him on the field enough to know how this transaction and playing a different position is going to work for him. Uh, last year was not great had a one and a half sacks that's not okay and six sacks is a career after three years again that's kind of who this guy is turning into be so he's got to step his game up again I, I was kind of hoping we would trade him but I don't think you can get a return on value he's a guy that will start for us and play a lot of snaps if he is healthy and he still has that high ceiling he just hasn't hit it so if he is a guy that could step up, and I know I'm using these numbers a lot, but if he gets over six sacks this year, man, I think it could be special. And we already picked up his fifth-year option. Now, again, will he play with us? Who knows? He is, he's got a $3.1 million against the cap this year, and next year he will be making close to a little over $9 million because we picked up that option. That number could change a little bit because it averages out a little bit differently. But again, we picked up his option. We'll just kind of see what happens. That guarantees him through injury, not necessarily through other different avenues where he could not receive that full compensation. He only played 300 snaps for us last year, and his main problem has been a shoulder injury. Going all the way back to 2015, he was listed as probable or questionable for about eight games, all because of this shoulder. And then the whole offseason takes place. He, he comes back, and then he messed it up real bad and had to go to IR in 2016. Well, he rested for a year and a half. So we were hoping, man, this is going to be great. He comes back, then he breaks his hand. And he tried to play through it, but he just wasn't productive. So he went on IR again last year. So anytime you have back-to-back seasons where you uh, are on IR, that's not okay. The, The front office for the 49ers has shown if you are not dependable through injury, you're not going to be sticking around. So that's what that is. Now I want to get to... A guy I am super high on, and that is Ronald Blair. Six foot four, two hundred and seventy pounds. He's only twenty five years old again. So again, you, these ages that we have for these players. Solomon Thomas, he's twenty two. DeForest Buckner, he is twenty five, and our oldest, which is just insane. Then we get Eric Armstead, twenty four. Ronald Blair, twenty five. We don't have a player on the defensive line that plays that in spot that's over twenty five. We drafted him 142nd overall in the fifth round out of Appalachian State, the Fighting Mountaineers. Man, I love Appalachian State, guys. They, uh, they, they just seem to want it, and they seem to play, and that's who he is. He has an incredible motor and is beyond powerful. He's kind of like a wrestler-type build where he just he's very reliable and a very physical tackler, and he can play all four of the defensive line positions. I'd have no problem with him at nose tackle because he plays with great leverage and great hands. Now, he is a little bit vulnerable against the run. Uh, he does get overpowered in kind of double teams and base blocking situations, and he doesn't change direction quickly, but he makes up for that with his insane motor. So absolutely love this kid. He's only started two games for us in his career, but he has been 
He's backed up nearly every spot on the defensive line. He has five career sacks. He got injured last year, which was a bummer. But I, I really do think that this is a guy who might not start for us. But again, I can see him pushing close to 400 to 500 defensive snaps. Now, I will say this. His physical skill set limits him big time. But once you put on the tape and he is on the field, it's just hard to take him off. He, he's a guy that registers as a positive on a majority of plays. And he just seems to be a guy that gets it if he can just stay on the field. That, that's kind of what we need here. His contract is super, super cheap. Um, the cap hit for the next two years, uh, just under 700000 this year and then under 800000 next year. So we still have him at two years on a super cheap deal. And that's one of the big reasons why I just cannot see him getting cut is if you cut him, you got to bring in somebody else and or promote somebody, which we'll talk about some of those options. But he is my last lock for this roster. And again, he had that big thumb injury that hurt him last year. Um, he just couldn't close his hand very well, but that should be fine. And I really do think that he's going to be a player that's going to excel and play a lot of special team snaps as well. Now, the guys that are outside looking in, and one of these is a rookie draft round draft pick this year, and that's Julian Taylor, a 23-year-old rookie out of the seventh round out of the Temple, the Fight Nowles. Now, again, 6'5", 280. We keep seeing this 280. Uh, it just seems to be the number that just gets our coaches excited. Strengths, he's very athletic and powerful. He's a guy that explodes off tape, and his testing definitely attributes to that. He was the second-rated Spark athlete. That was a D lineman. And what Spark is is it basically measures all of your measurements, like 40, vertical, shuttle and all these things and it adjusts that towards your height and weight and it comes up with a score that basically says how athletic you are for your size and so he was the number two most athletic by this measurement just next to Taven Bryan the defensive tackle out of Florida he went in the first round to Jacksonville I think around pick 28 or so Uh, not sure about the exact pick but I think it was pick 28 anyway it just puts you what it does is it paints a picture for what this guy's ceiling is. And we did this last year. We took another super high spark athlete last year in the seventh round with Adrian Colbert, and now he's going to be our starting free safety. So in the late rounds, we continue to see John Lynch do this where he takes these high-risk gambles, but we're not paying that much. It's a seventh-round pick. Seventh-round picks usually are about a 50-50 chance to make a roster depending on how young and how good your lineup is. And the thing for Julian Taylor, this is the strongest position group that we have. And so if he is going to fight in and get a spot, I don't think he takes one of these four off the roster. I think they are safe. I think he'll take a spot from a nose tackle. So that's what we're going to be talking about next episode. Or we're going to highlight the nose tackles. And there's a couple guys that are kind of on the line there and if julian taylor can impress this year the rookie out of temple this year and seventh round pick i think he takes one of their spots because he could play some of that he's six five now the weaknesses to his game he has had it he's only played one year because of injuries so out of four years in college he kind of sat back his first year then he tore his acl then he had surgery again then he had some hip issues and so he's only played one year now that year he played he was legit but he's going to have to make it through training camp and impress because to get him on the field, you're taking some studs off. Um, I would not be surprised if we waive him and try to find a way to keep him uh, on our practice squad or something along those lines. But he is one that, again, I have him as a 50-50 making the roster right now. We will see. And then our other pick, Contavious Street. We got him in the fourth round. He's only 21 years old, and his age makes a difference for us. Because we got him in the fourth round out of NC State. He's a defensive end, 6'2", 280. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> that, that, I don't understand the 280 significance, but whenever you have four out of eight guys with that exact same weight at the exact same position, I think we're profiling a little bit too much, but that's okay. But the problem with him is he blew his ACL whenever he was doing a pre-draft workout in April. So there is 0% chance that this kid can make the roster this year. He will be on injured reserve. And a lot of the fan base got really, really upset with this pick because, you know, we just got rid of Trent Baalke. I shouldn't even said his name. Our past GM, let me say that, 
he loved taking all these ACL players, and they never panned out. They never panned out. And so that that was kind of rough. And so whenever we picked him in the fourth round again, people got upset. And John Lynch got on whenever he got on the mic, and he said, look, here's the goal of our draft now. Last year, 2017, again, this is John Lynch talking, we were just trying to fill spots. We had to get people on the field automatically because we just didn't have anybody to play that fit what we were trying to do. Now in 2018 draft, what we are trying to do is build cornerstones for the future. And they think that Kentavious Street is one of those guys. And he's not going to play a snap this year, but he's only 21. And he has these traits. Again, you talk about cornerstone pieces. We love this 280 measurement, and he's got it. Now, he's very, very thick-bottomed guy, but beyond explosive. He had a 700-pound squat in college, and he is mean as hell. And what I mean by that is whenever he does show up to tackle, he's not an arm tackle type of guy. He is a drive-through and hurt people kind of guy. And he's pretty fun to watch. It's just, we'll have to see. It's already a deep position, and I really do believe that The eventual idea here is he's going to take Eric Armstead's spot on our roster and our starting lineup. That is what they're hoping, and they spent a fourth-round pick on this. So if he comes out and is our starting right-side defensive end next year, then this would be a great play. But again, we're not going to know that. And the good thing is he will be an IR candidate, so he's a guy that we will stash And we'll just have to wait and see what happens next year with him because he's not going to be playing this year. Just not going to happen. Now, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. And as I said, again, make sure you go follow our new stat guy. He is helping out a lot with the 49ers Rush podcast. And he's just a cool guy anyway. I'll give it to him. He's a Canadian, so y'all go give him a hard time. Uh, That's at Cadeau Clayton, C-A-D-I-E-U-X, Clayton. And stay strong, faithful.